Good morning. I want to start this with uh, prayer. So let's all bow and ask the Lord to speak to us. Heavenly Father, we come to your word this morning with an open heart. I pray, Lord, that you would speak, pray that you would convict, that you would challenge, that you would encourage. Pray, Lord, that your word would say what your word says. And I pray, Lord, that we would take that to heart and apply that to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been uh, going through a series through the entire scriptures. I'm not going to go and summarize it all. You can listen back to those messages. We've talked about all sorts of things. And we've gone through the first four books of the Bible. And really, we don't cover a lot of new ground today. Deuteronomy is one of those books of the Bible that is in summary of the beginning part of the Bible. And th- these are Moses' parting words. These are Moses', really, Moses is describing the, the story up until they get to the promised land. Deuteronomy gives us that picture of what has happened up until that point. And then also, it is, it's a very applicable book of the Bible. There's a lot of application in Deuteronomy. Surprisingly practical for us today. This is the last book that Moses writes. The first five books of the Bible, Moses writes. Um, and he kind of... He, he brings things to truths that these Israelites can take with them into the promised land. And so it's, it's theology, but then it's also very, very, very practical. Deuteronomy is also seen as one of the more important books of the Bible throughout the Bible. It is used more than any other book in the Bible. It is quoted more than any other book of the Bible. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy many times in his ministry. Uh, The quotes that Jesus uses in his temptation, they come from Deuteronomy. The whole scriptures quote the book 445 times. When I read through this this week and the last week, I decided that I would listen to it, and I was glad that I did. It, it, it helped me to get into the story. It helped me to become one of the Israelites. It felt as if I was listening to Moses speak. Many people would say that this is three sermons by Moses. Boy, they're long sermons, right? So if you want a challenge for this week, when you go through especially this book, I would encourage you to listen to it and read along because it really does come alive. And you can almost hear Moses speaking these words to the Israelites. Three sermons. Now, these are the sermons that he speaks, if, if it's going to work. It's going to work? Yes, Nelson. It's going to work today. The three sermons, the fir- chapters one through four, it focuses on the history from Egypt to the border of the promised land. This is where Moses is giving these words. It's a short one. The next one is a little bit longer. This is more like Blaine preaching. Uh, It's the Sinai Covenant. And it's kind of this, it's a rehashing of the Sinai Covenant with its laws and calls for obedience, chapters 5 through 26. In fact, the name Deuteronomy is called, there's some kids in school that I know are going through this right now. What's it called? Maybe you don't know this. Maybe you guys specifically haven't been going. It's called Second Law. That's what the word Deuteronomy means. So this was a reminder of the law, but then it also adds some things that the Israelites are to do in the context of going into the promised land. Additional laws that will help get them established when they get into the promised land. And then the third sermon, again, a short one, on what would happen if the Israelites obeyed or disobeyed the covenant. We get blessings and curses. And there's a really interesting story at the end, or a command that uh, Moses gives, where these two uh, the two groups, half the tribes go on one mountain, half the tribes go on the other mountain, and they start yelling out blessings and curses into the center where the Levites shout out, Amen! <laughs> and 
And it's a really strange picture, but I encourage you to read that. It'll come up in your reading in a couple weeks. Blessings and curses. And then the book ends with, uh, with Joshua being given leadership over these people. Joshua, you are going to bring these people into the promised land. So, look at it. Those three sermons. What do they look like? Well, really, um, he works through history, past, present, and future. He works through what has happened in the past, what God requires of them in the present, and then how that will affect their future. It's kind of looking back in remembrance, but always with the idea to move forward to new realities, to new experiences, to obedience, and ultimately, blessing. Physically, that's where the Israelites are. They have completed the wilderness wanderings. They're at the border of the promised land. Moses has led them this far, but he's, no, he's going to be staying on this side of the Jordan River because of his own disobedience to the Lord, not trusting God. That you read about in Numbers. So like any good leader, Moses stands up, gives them these final words, the final lesson that their priest Moses wants to give them, the most important things for them to remember and follow into the future. They're at that crossroads, looking back, moving forward. This morning, I want to focus on one particular chapter that stood out in this. And this chapter has all of the elements of the whole book in mind. And it's kind of a middle verse, too. And it, it, as, as we're, we're centering on looking back and moving forward, this also does that. And it's kind of at this central place in Deuteronomy. The rest of the book, I will encourage you to read. There is some good reading in here. Um, this, this was a very exciting book for me to read through. Yes, there is some, some strange laws in there, uh, like, uh, like we've read up until this point. Laws that, um, that were very much designed for a purpose in that situation. But it also gives us a good glimpse into God's call for his people Israel. So read it. Read along. Uh, if you haven't, if you've given up at this point uh, in the reading plan, continue. Just start in Deuteronomy and go for it. Uh, if, you, if you've been following along, continue. If you haven't read it all, start. This is a great place to start. And so uh, I encourage you to keep on going in that reading plan. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Please turn there because we're going to look at this in a little bit more detail this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's start at verse 1. It says this. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. We're going to pick up on the first three verses in a little bit, but I want to, uh, within this central chapter of Deuteronomy is a central statement, a central idea that has been very important for the Jewish people from the beginning uh, of this or from when this was written. This idea is found in verse 4 and and 5. These verses are referred to in Hebrew as the Shema. I would try and explain it to you, but I found someone that could explain it a little bit better and with a little bit more uh, of a visual aid, and so I'm going to get a video to explain it. Uh, Here is what Shema means. Go ahead now. 
For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Now the first word of the Shema is hear or listen, which in Hebrew is pronounced Shema. That's where the prayer gets its name. Now Shema is a really common word in the Hebrew Bible, and it's obvious why. Hearing is a very universal activity. It's usually connected with the ear, as in Proverbs chapter 20, ears that Shema and eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. Now that seems basic enough, but if you look at the other ways that Hebrew authors can use the word Shema, they use it to mean more than just let sound waves enter your ear. In Hebrew, Shema can also mean pay attention to or focus on. So when Leah, who wasn't loved by her husband Jacob, she has a son and she names him Simon, or in Hebrew, Shimon, because she says, the Lord has Shamad, that I am unloved. So Shema means to hear and to pay attention to and even more. It can also mean responding to what you hear. This is why so many of the cries for help in the book of Psalms begin with a call that God listen. Psalm 27 verse 7, Shema my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful, answer me. So asking God to Shema is at the same time asking God to act, to do something. It's similar to when God asks people to listen. Like when the people of Israel come to Mount Sinai, God says, if you Shema me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Now there's a couple interesting things about this verse in Exodus. In Hebrew, the word Shema is repeated twice in this sentence to give it emphasis. If you Shema Shema, meaning listen closely. But also notice that from God's point of view, listening is basically the same as keeping the covenant. So when God asks the people to Shema, what he means is that they listen and obey. And that's the last fascinating thing about Shema. In ancient Hebrew, there is no separate word for obey, meaning to carry out the wishes of someone who knows better than you or is in authority over you. So in the Bible, if you want to say, I will listen and do what you say, you use the single word Shema. In Hebrew, listening and doing are two sides of the same coin. This is why later in Israel's history, when the people were breaking their covenant promises to God, the Hebrew prophets would say things like, they have ears, but they're not listening. The Israelites, of course, could hear just fine, but they weren't actually listening or else they would act differently. And so in the end, listening in the Bible is about giving respect to the one speaking to you and doing what they say. Real listening takes effort and action, and that's the Hebrew word Shema. So listen, and don't just hear it. Respond to it. And that becomes an important theme in the rest of the chapter and really throughout Deuteronomy. Listen, but don't just listen. Don't just hear it. Respond to it. Look back and remember what God has done and respond in the future to what you remember. Does that make sense? We're not just listening. We're not just remembering, but we're responding to it. And that's what Shema means. It, go, it goes back to this look back, but move forward. Don't just look back. Don't just hear. Move forward and obey as well. Very rich word. And then the second part, if you look closely at this, hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What's the next quote? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and with all your strength. When Jesus is asked what the most important command is, he responds with that. This is the most important command. Deuteronomy 6 verse 5. This is how you respond to hearing that the Lord is our God and the Lord is one. You love him with all your heart, soul, and strength. How had the Israelites done with this? Had they done pretty good with this? Responding? Not too well. They one by one break the commands they've been given. They fail to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and strength. And so the question is, how is God going to get these crazy people, these forgetful people, to listen and respond? 
And so as we come to the prophets a little bit later on, we start to learn how God wants to do this and how he intends to do this. We won't go into that today, but we will talk about it when we especially go through Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Now, that's Shema. Now, I want to go on a little rabbit trail right now. We're going to all be rabbits and we're going to go off the trail a little bit. Up until this point, we have seen three covenants made with the people of Israel or with, with, between God and people. The first one is in Genesis when God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, rule over creation, take care of it. And, and here's one of the things you are to remember. You may eat from any tree in the garden except one of those trees, and that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he gives the terms of this. If you eat from it, you will certainly die. That's covenant language. We know how that went. Adam and Eve disobey, and thus the consequences come upon them. They try and define what is good and evil in their own terms. They don't trust what God has said, and they have the consequences attached. Second covenant was the covenant made to Abraham. Genesis 12, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You will be blessed, and you will be a blessing. He says this. The Israelites are on the cusp of, the pro of, of that part of that being fulfilled, on the edge of the promised land. But then there's the third covenant, and that was made at Mount Sinai, and it's talked about again in Deuteronomy. The law, the constitution of the Israelite nation, and really the statement at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 5 summarizes this. What does it say at the end? Starting at verse, uh, starting at verse 32. So the Ten Commandments have been given, and it says this, So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord has commanded you, so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. That's really a summary of the covenant at Mount Sinai. Three covenants. They're not all the same covenant. Have you ever thought about that? Two of those are conditional covenants. You do this, and this will happen. One of them is unconditional. This will happen. And that's very important as we move forward in the scriptures. One is conditional, one is unconditional. Do this, you'll be blessed. But the, Abra the, the covenant to Abraham... That will happen. And what's very interesting is that as we stand here, looking back, the fulfillment of all of these actually came through Christ for us. The fulfillment of all three of these ultimately comes through Christ. And we'll start to see that language being talked about as we move through the scriptures. So, we've reached the end of that rabbit trail. We'll come back to that rabbit trail in a little while. We've established these are different covenants. One unconditional, it will happen. The other two unconditional, or sorry, the other two conditional. It will happen if something else happens. If you fulfill your part of the bargain. Let's keep reading. See how Moses talks about looking backward. Starting at verse 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. In other words, remember them. Remember the commands. Don't forget them. Not only the commandments, but remember what I have done. And as, as it continues, 
Pass them on to your children, but also remember and pass on what I have done to your children. When the Lord your God, this is verse 10, when the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Be careful that you do not forget what the Lord has done. Remember. Remember the past. Remember who God is and what he has done. And then he continues, and I believe with the past in mind, he says this, verse 13, Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massah, looking back at one of the times that the Israelites complained. Verse 17, Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so that it may go well with you and you may go in and take over the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors, thrusting out all your enemies before you. You see it? Over and over. Look back there. Look back to the covenant. Look back to your rebellion. Look back. Look at how those things went in the wilderness. Learn from those things. Remember so that. And then there's an interesting section where Moses gives an example of how you are to respond in remembrance. And I found this to be interesting. Verse 20. In the future, when your son asks you, what's the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord your God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we're careful to obey all of this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. Do you notice this looking back constantly? The Lord rescued us. He proved who he was, who he is. And so if the Lord has done that, then we must respond in obedience. Basically what Moses is saying, remember what he has done and who he is who God is. He sent great and terrible wonders. Remember those plagues? Remember the death of the firstborn? Ah. And yet, he spared us. He could have just wiped us out. If that's what he wanted, he could have done that. But he saved us. He rescued us. And so when he commands us to do something, and especially if he says we will prosper if we do it, then we should probably do it. It goes back to verse 13. Fear the Lord. Recognizing that he could, if he wanted to, he could strike us down just like that. Remember. Remember who we serve. Remember what happened. As you read this week, take note of how many times Moses calls the people to remember. It's not just in chapter 6. All over the place. So we look back to learn, but we do so in order to move forward. That's the theme in Moses' sermons. I heard a story about three old ladies. They were in their 90s and they were living together. One of them was going to take a bath, and so she 
uh, dipped her toe into the bathtub, and all of a sudden she kind of yelled out, Help! I don't know if I was going into the tub or coming out of the tub. And so one of the other ladies, she started up the stairs and said, Just hold on! And she stopped and she said, I don't know if I'm going up or down. She forgot. And then the other lady was having tea. And she said, I hope I never get that forgetful. And then, the, you know that stupid stitious way where someone knocks on wood? She knocked on wood. And then she said, just hold on. I'm going to come and help you just as soon as I see who's at the door. Moving forward becomes difficult if we don't remember. It did for these ladies and it did for the Israelites. Chapter 5 gives the Ten Commandments and they are firmly rooted in remembrance. First statement in the Ten Commandments before Moses gives them. He says this in reference from God. This is what he brings out to the people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, and then the Ten Commandments come. Remember that I am God who cared so much about you that I saved you from slavery in Egypt. Now here are the commands. Do not forget. Do not forget. Do not forget. Chapter 6 not only teaches us to remember, but it also teaches us to obey. It's all over the place. Verse 3, hear Israel and be careful to obey. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Verse 6, these commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Verse 13, fear the Lord your God, serve him only. Verse 17, be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God. Verse 18, do what is right and good in the Lord's sight. Verse 24, the Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God. And then verse 25, if we're careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God as he commands us, that will be our righteousness. And so remembrance and obedience come together. Sound like Shema? Hear, remember, but respond. Respond. And so remembrance and obedience come together. And so first we obey out of response to his saving us. Out of response who is bringing us into the promised land. First John says what? We love because he first loved us. Remember? Now respond. He's shown us love. Now love. Second thing, remember and obey because when you do, people will notice you as a nation. There's an interesting little part in chapter 4 that gives us a little bit of a, um, an idea and explains what God's purposes were for the Israelites when they went into the land and followed his commands. Let's look at that. Chapter 4, starting at verse 8. Sorry, verse 6. It says, I've taught you decrees. So verse 5 says, I've taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully. For this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today. Wow. The commands were about truth and justice and taking care of people, both their own and others. It was so absolutely different than the nations around them. This was structured. This was organized. This was wisdom. And especially in that culture, the nations around them had barbaric laws, crazy things. 
These commands set the Israelites apart from every other nation around them. And if you remember, if we go back to Leviticus, what was the purpose? It was to set them apart. To make them holy. So much so that people would ask, where does this wisdom come from? Their God gave them these? What a God. And then finally, they were taught to obey so that they'll receive blessing. Look at all the so that's in this passage. There's so many so that's. So that, remember and obey so that you, your children and their children after them may fear the, the Lord your God. So that your kids will be blessed and that they will remember. So that you may enjoy long life. Verse 3, so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land. In other words, I don't want you just to survive. I actually want you to thrive there. I want there to be blessing. Verse 18, so that it may go well with you, and you may go in and take over the good land. Remember what happened when the 12 spies went in? 40 years of wandering. A whole generation missed out on the promise of God. Verse 24, so that we might always prosper and be, be alive. Blessing comes from obeying the commands God gave them. Let's go back to our rabbit trail for just a few minutes in closing. Two covenants. One, blessing comes from obeying. Israel obey. But also remember that blessing also comes through the promise of God. That's at play in here as well. Blessing also comes through the promise of God, through His grace. And I believe that this is where remembrance and obedience and grace and blessing all come together to show us a picture of God's ultimate purpose. And standing on this side of Jesus, we look back and all of this comes to a head with Jesus. Look at verse 10 to 12 again. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you. Now get this. A land with large, flourishing cities you did not build. Hmm. Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. Wells you did not dig. Vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then you will, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget. Do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Was it your goodness that brought you out of that? Was it your goodness that brought you into the land? No. You did not do this. Then in chapter 9, Moses says this. Verse 5. It's not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you're going in to take possession of their land. But on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then, that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God has given you this good land to possess. For you are a stiff-necked people. Do not forget. Do not forget the Lord and His promise and the gift that God is giving you. When we forget that promise, we could quickly think, that we have this blessing of the promised land because of our good deeds. Look at how great we are. That is not why you have the promised land. You have the promised land because it was promised by a faithful God. You have it because God was faithful to you. 
even in the midst of your unfaithfulness. You are called to respond to His grace with obedience, yes. But it is not because of your response that you gain the promised land. It is because of the promise. You respond so that others will see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You respond because it is the right way to life. But the ultimate blessing comes from the grace of God. That is clear in Deuteronomy. What does Paul say in Ephesians chapter 2? For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. When we start boasting, we stop looking back at history. We stop looking back at the fact that it was God's grace that saved. That we deserved punishment. We're very stiff-necked then, right? <laughs> we can't turn and look back. So once again, Moses surprises us with the gospel. Once again, Moses lays a foundation for the gospel. The gospel that we look back to and we follow. The gospel that Jesus came not because of the righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. He came and he forgave. This all points to God's grace and God's plan of redemption. I'd like to call up the music team. And as they do that, let me share a couple of words. What are we to remember today as Christians? Here's a few things. Remember what God has done on the cross of Jesus. The deliverance from slavery to sin. Remember why Jesus died so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins and to enter the promised land. And then remember, for all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. God promises that. And then we can praise the Lord as we remember so, how do we shema? We've heard the message, and now we respond with our very lives being given to him. Let's move forward by obeying his commands to love God and love others. Because then, they will know we are Christians. What does it say? They will know you are Christians by your love. Love of God and love of others. Let's move forward and Shema because the abundant life is best lived in obedience to the Father. And so we're going to sing this song as remembrance and as you're singing, consider how can I respond to this that we are remembering. Amen. Amen.